And then I told her, Michaela, pray, I'm going to kill her. I felt the release after doing it, like I've never felt before in my life. You felt good? Yes. She told us that she was a 42 generational witch in the satanic church and uh, that uh, she came out of satanism and then when she came out of satanism that the satanic church wanted to kill her. Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hello, my name is Bongi and thank you so very much for stopping by. I hope that you'll like what you see and hopefully also subscribe to my channel and join the fam. Today's video is on a cult that literally lives rent free in my head. I've been wanting to do this video since a video about this cult since 2021. Uh, I've been wanting to do the video even before the documentary came out and then when the documentary called Devil's Dog came out, um, I think one of my followers, oh actually I remember who it was, um, DM'd me and told me, Bungi, you have to make a video about this. And I've been trying to make a video on this cult for years, literally, since 2021 and then last year I also filmed this around October but then I wasn't satisfied with the end result so here we are trying this again this time around i've tried to put the events that happened in this case um in a way that will make sense to you guys because this case is just one huge mess so when you think you have it all figured out something else pops up and then it just shocks you again so you know what for you guys i tried to put this in a way that's going to make sense to everybody and it wasn't so easy for me to do that so i hope you guys will appreciate it and also find this um enjoyable and informative and also i will be putting the timestamps so that you can kind of be able to tell how things went down this is gonna be the longest video on my channel i know this for a fact because i've never covered something as big as this i even had to kind of leave some information out information that i thought was not important but i will edit in the comments eventually maybe not now but like i'll edit in the comments every time i find something new or whatever piece of information that i've left out i'll definitely edit in the comments yeah so without wasting any more of your time this is already gonna be a long video i'm not gonna ramble i'm not gonna go on any longer we're just gonna get right into it On the 10th of May 2016, in the town of Krugersdorp, police discover an abandoned car parked outside a primary school. In the boot of the car, they found the body of Anthony Schofield and he had been stuffed inside black plastic bags. He had very clearly been strangled to death and an amount summing up to about 16,600 had been withdrawn from his bank account. He was a financial advisor who had disappeared after going to an appointment that he had at 6 p.m. But before police could go any further with their investigation, only 16 days later, on the 26th of May, yet another financial advisor, Kevin McAlpine, went missing after going to an appointment that he had at 6pm. Similar to the first victim, Kevin had also been strangled to death. His body had also been stuffed inside black plastic bags and put inside the boot of his car. And... An amount of 1300 had been withdrawn from his bank account. The two murders were very quickly connected because the modus operandi was exactly the same. Both these victims had some money withdrawn from their bank accounts. They had been strangled, um, stuffed inside black plastic bags and then put inside the boot of their very own cars. So very quickly, it was very, the police were very quick to connect the two cases and this was enough to spook the town people were cancelling their appointments nobody wanted to have an appointment at 6 p.m more especially financial advisors people were very wary financial advisors were very wary of appointments that they had at 6 p.m and a lot of them just started cancelling them it seemed as if this person was specifically targeting financial advisors but to everyone's horror only four days after the discovery of kevin McAlpine's body another person went missing but this time it was not a financial advisor it was instead a real estate agent called Henley Latakhan. 
On the 30th of May 2016, Henley was scheduled for an appointment at 6 p.m. Her husband started becoming, getting worried when Henley didn't come back home and he realized that there were some people or someone trying to withdraw money from Henley's account. Henley's car was found abandoned outside Krugersdorp Hospital, but unlike the other two victims, her body was not found in the boot of the car. Her car was actually empty. She was instead found dumped in a ditch somewhere in Krugersdorp. From the hospital CCTV footages, Henley was seen getting out of her car as a woman with black hair and dressed in black clothing approached her and then the two of them walked off together to a vicinity where the hospital CCTV cameras could not capture them. And that was the last sighting of Henley Latigan. After Henley's murder, it became clear to the public that not only financial advisors were at risk but everyone with an appointment at 6 p.m. was at risk and so at this time people just started cancelling their appointments even more like even more people it wasn't just financial advisors this time everyone was cancelling their appointments and it became a new thing that everyone had to be home by 6 p.m. because these people were out to murder and they were out to murder at 6 p.m. That was just a common assumption. By this time, the murders had garnered a lot of media attention. They had become or made it to national headlines, and so the media dubbed these murders the appointment murders. Police were already working tirelessly to try and catch the perpetrator, but with the news now becoming national news, national headlines, the pressure was rising. Captain Boyson was then put on this case, and the police continued working on this case trying to solve it. The police started going through the various ATM CCTV cameras footages to try and figure out who had been withdrawing money from the victim's bank account and that's when they came across the Stain children, LaRue and Marcel Stain. The two were immediately arrested and taken in for questioning. LaRue was just 20 years old at this time and what he was doing was little odd jobs here and there to make money and Marcel on the other hand had just graduated from high school and she had gotten six distinctions. The two of them just seemed like pretty normal kids and no one would ever associate them with these murders. No one ever thought that they were the appointment murderers. So the two of them had been caught through the ATM CCTV footages meaning that they could directly be linked to the victim's bank accounts but that didn't necessarily mean that they could be linked to the murders and so police still had quite a lot of work to do to find out who the murderers were. During the first questioning, Marcel was very difficult to work with. She was actually very difficult to work with police like the entire time all the way till her trial. But during this time specifically, she was extremely difficult. She didn't want to cooperate and she also swore at the police a couple of times. But eventually when they managed to get through to her in some way, um, the story or the explanation that she gave to the police was that um, her and her brother had nothing to do with the murders, that there were some Nigerian men who gave her brother the bank cards together with their pins and all they did was like withdraw money from these bank cards but they didn't know anything about who the bank cards belonged to and who killed the victims but she was kind of implying that the Nigerians were the ones who killed the victims but because she said that the Nigerians were working with her brother she obviously couldn't give the police the identity of these Nigerians. I think during the time when she was being difficult to the police, she was still trying to like come up with a story in her head to, that she could give to the police, a believable story, because she is a pretty smart girl. I mean, if she, if she got six distinctions, that means she's smart, and I think that she was trying to come up with a story that would be pretty believable to the police, but this one, this one is trash. Let's be real. It's trash, isn't it? Quite contrastingly, LaRue was very cooperative with the police. He cooperated, he told them everything, and he confessed. He took responsibility for everything. Basically told them that he's the one who killed all those people, and he's the one who withdrew all the money from their bank accounts. Nobody helped him. He did it all by himself. His sister was not involved, nobody else was involved, and it was all LaRue. But he was a pretty scrawny little man, he was lanky, he didn't really look that strong or that fit. So police just knew that he was protecting somebody because there was no way he could have killed these people. He could have like overpowered these people, strangled them, and then also been able to lift their bodies and put them in the boot of their car. Because like, somebody 
I feel like a dead body is super heavier than a normal person because even like a sleeping person is generally heavier than a person who's alive <laughs> and awake. <laughs> So, um, police just knew that there was no way LaRue could have done this alone. He was definitely protecting somebody, but they just had to figure out who it is that he was protecting. Once the news broke that the Stain children had been arrested, somebody tipped off the police, somebody phoned the police and told them that they had to search Marinda Stain's classroom. So, Marinda Stain was the mother of both LaRue and Marcel Stain. She was a high school teacher. She was charismatic and loving and bubbly. Bubbly? I don't, I'm not sure about bubbly, but her students did like her. After the children got arrested, she told the media that she was very heartbroken. She didn't think that her children were responsible. And so nobody thought at this initial stage that Marinda could have some involvement. So when police received this phone call to go search Marinda Stain's classroom, they were beyond confused. They were just like, why are we going there? Why, what are we going to do there? So they didn't know what to expect, but upon searching Miranda Stain's classroom, they found ammunition hidden inside the two ovens that were in her classroom, which had previously been a home economics classroom. While the police and staff were still shocked by this discovery, another staff member approached Captain Boyson and told him that Miranda Stain had amended a will and that the will was around there somewhere. So this will was given... was eventually handed over to Captain Boyson and in this will Miranda Stain had completely disowned her children. She had stated that she wanted nothing to do with her children and that upon her death everything that she owned, all her earthly possessions should be given to a woman named Cecilia Stain. So police at this time knew from just talking to LaRue that he must be protecting somebody but like I said they didn't know who it was that he was protecting but from this discovery of live ammunition in his mother's classroom, they just got the impression that LaRue must be protecting his mother. Even though the victims were not had not been shot, this was just way too suspicious. There had to be some sort of connection there. And so they took this will to LaRue, hoping that when LaRue saw this and read it and realized that her, his mother had disowned him, he would open up to the police and eventually read her out. And it worked. So once police had shown LaRue this will written in his mother's handwriting and he had read his mother completely disowning him and his sister and putting this woman called Cecilia Stain in his and her in his sister's position, he just began singing. He was like, flip this, I'm gonna read them all out. And to the police's shock, LaRue actually confessed that the murders actually began way back in 2012. This case was so much bigger than the police ever could have imagined and in order for us to make sense of everything and unravel this tangled mess of a case, we're going to have to go all the way back to 2012 and meet a woman called Ria Grunewald who is I think the connecting factor of each and every person who played a role in this case. Even though she is innocent herself, she did kind of connect each and every one. We are going to circle back to 2016 of course but in order for this to make sense we're just going to have to travel all the way back to 2012. So Ria Grunewald was a devout Christian with a burning passion to help people get closer to God. She started a ministry called Overcomers Through Christ back in 2006 and through this ministry she would do um, outreaches during her spare time to just go to people, teach people about God and teach people about the dangers of Satanism. From the late 90s, pouring into the 2000s and even pouring into the early 2010s, there was this satanic panic going on. I don't know if it was just in South Africa, in that Southern African um, region, but there was a lot of satanic panic going on. A lot of people were scared, not only for their lives and their beliefs and their faith, but also uh, the faith of their children and family members. People were burning Harry Potter books. They were burning anything that had to do with Spider-Man, Spider-Man comic books, Spider-Man mo movies, anything that had to do with fairies, dwarves, wizards. 
Santa Claus and many other things because they believed that by possessing these things you were eventually giving Satan or the demon a way into your life. This like possession of certain material was sort of creating a doorway for Satan to come into your life, come into your home and so they were doing all these things in the hopes of exterminating Satan and letting Satan know that he was not welcome at all in their homes. People were very afraid and anxious about the unknown and some people would go above and beyond to learn about Satanism, Satan and the occult just so that they could know how to protect themselves and their families essentially. They weren't learning so they could participate, they were learning so that they know the right armor to carry with them to this battle. So Ria Grunewald was also one of those people who wanted to be well equipped for this battle against Satan. She was learning about Satanism, the dangers of Satanism and all that so that she could be well equipped for this fight. So through this ministry of hers, Rhea wanted to actually help people who had um, escaped or left the sat satanic church or satanism and help them get closer to God and that's when she en enrolled for a training in trauma counseling for people who had suffered from um, satanic abuse or satanic ritualistic abuse. She was also a volunteer caregiver for people who had survived such abuse. One day, Rhea received a call about a woman who had escaped from the satanic church and was in dire need of Rhea's help. This woman went by the name of Cecilia Stain. Cecilia told Rhea that she was a 42nd generational witch and that she was also known as the Bride of Satan. She told Rhea that due to her high rank, the Satanic Church was not willing to let her leave. And so by leaving, by escaping from this church, her life was in a lot of danger. And Rhea was so fascinated and captured by this woman's story that she wanted to do everything in her power to help her. She then developed a course under her ministry called Know Your Enemy and under this course she wanted to educate people about the ins and outs of Satanism, the ins and outs of Satan because she believed that the best war tactic is to know your enemy and know how your enemy operates so that you can be well equipped for the fight like I said. This was around the time of the Monet Haramza case and people were just afraid, anxious, nervous, they were scared for themselves and their families' lives so a lot of people started joining this course to learn about their enemy so that they could better fight, better, so that they could be better prepared for the war ahead. This entire course was based on Cecilia's accounts of what went down within the satanic church and because of her high rank a lot of people didn't even question her word a lot of people just took her word and believed it and they ran with it nobody knew anything about satanism so cecilia here was this person coming with new information shedding light on the things that they want to know and this person was he w she was here she would attend these courses as living proof that satanism can be that you can leave satanism and not only that, she was also giving them a heads up, I guess, on how their enemy worked. So a lot of people just believed her and they took everything that she said. They went with it. One of the people who attended this course was Marinda Stain and she would attend these lessons, these sessions with her two young children, LaRue and Marcel Stain. She had first met Rhea through one of her outreaches at her school and she had become fascinated by Cecilia's testimony so she started attending the evening sessions very quickly after meeting Cecilia. Marcel was probably around 9 or 10 when she was first introduced to Cecilia Stain through the Know Your Enemy course. So the group was told by Cecilia herself that the Satanic Church was constantly trying to kill her because she had not only left the church but she was now also giving people information about what goes on within the Satanic Church. Through these stories, Cecilia also managed to convince Rhea as well as the other members that she needed protection 24-7. Poor Ria was so dedicated in helping her that she actually moved into the Kosana flats where uh, Cecilia stayed because she wanted to be close to Cecilia in case she needed any form of help or prayers or anything at all. She wanted to be 
literally just a few steps away. There were also some people who were appointed to take turns in watching Cecilia and some who volunteered. And Miranda Stain was again part of this group and she would always bring her two young children along. Among the lies that Cecilia told the group, she also told them that she couldn't step outside a certain radius from her flat because if she ever stepped outside that radius, death curses would be activated and she would either be killed or pulled back into Satanism. Another lie was that she had a thousand personalities or over a thousand personalities and one of the, these personalities was a three-year-old girl named Anya and Anya represented everything good about Cecilia. So Cecilia told the group that the satanic church was constantly trying to murder Anya, to kill Anya because if they killed Anya then they could very easily get to Cecilia. So as you can imagine whenever this personality whenever Anya manifested and took over the whole group became very anxious around Anya Anya they would do everything to make sure that Anya was happy and satisfied and they would give Anya their full undivided attention and give Anya everything that she wanted another lie was that during or within the satanic church there are certain nights in the calendar such as Halloween which are very important and these nights are known as high nights. During the high nights the satanic church would perform a ritual so Cecilia's life was obviously in danger and because of this during these high nights the group would all meet up at Cecilia's flat and they'd start off by playing some gospel music and then they'd eventually break into prayer and their prayers would intensify. So Cecilia explained to the group that although her physical body was in their presence, her spirit was actually in a spiritual realm where the, these rituals were taking place. So all these people would just pray and pray and pray around Cecilia and then I don't know maybe mid ritual in the other realm something would happen to Cecilia and so these rituals, whatever they were doing to Cecilia, would manifest in her physical body. Cecilia would drop, she would fall to the floor and start having these seizure-like episodes while also bleeding from the mouth. And as you can imagine, their prayers just intensified whenever this happened to Cecilia and they would go on for a long time until eventually Cecilia would just stop and the prayer would end. Like she would just come back and then the prayers would stop. I'm imagining it as this intense and heated and very stuffy room where everybody's just yelling out their prayers, praying for Cecilia to be saved, praying for God to watch over this woman, praying, praying, praying while, while Cecilia's on the floor convulsing and just having an episode. And then, I don't know, I'm imagining this movie scene where like a, a, a cello or a violin is playing very hectically. <laughs> And then everyone's just like, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then Cecilia's just convulsing on the floor and then eventually everything just dish, stops. That's the kind of scene that I'm imagining during these high nights. It was an intense prayer session. It was always an intense prayer se session. And the group would always be so happy when Cecilia finally snapped out of it because they believed that their prayers were saving Cecilia, that they were helping their friend. But what they didn't know was that Cecilia was actually putting some blood inside little latex sachets and then whenever these episodes would start she would just bite down on the latex sachet and then start spitting out the blood and then performing for them whenever it's time for the performance she would give the performance of her life and i'm only i can only imagine what was going through her head as she be, like as she realized that these people truly believed her stories i wonder if she ever just laughed at them because i believe that she did she laughed at these poor people who were just trying to help her so these attacks these high nights started happening frequently more and more frequently and the more these happened the more the group had to spend time together and have these prayer sessions so the people within cecilia's inner circle included ria and marinda of course marinda's two children a woman called candace rijavec and zach and michaela valentine 
These are the people who would spend all their time with Cecilia, listening and feeding off of her lies and eventually becoming brainwashed. These people were literally protecting Cecilia with their very own lives and livelihoods. They got sucked into Cecilia's world and I don't even think they realized it until it was too late. So now we're familiar with most of the people within Cecilia's circle, apart from Zach and Michaela Valentine. Candace Rizhevac, I don't want to get into to her life story that much because she did not really form an integral part in the crime she was not there actually when the crime started taking place she was there during Cecilia's hysteria and performances and drama and all that but the moment the murders began Candace was not there she was not even a part of it so I don't want to get into her Michaela Valentine on the other hand was described as a happy-go-lucky person she was easygoing she was spontaneous she was lovable and just easygoing she suffered from substance abuse during her teenage years but she later found God and she never went back to a world of drugs she started preaching the word of God to people and really enjoyed this she was happy and making friends who were on a similar journey to hers. She and her husband Zach Valentine quickly hit it off soon after meeting and then they later tied the knot. Zach was the apple of Michaela's mom's eye. He he was a good guy and the family approved and Michaela's mom even felt as though Zach had been handpicked for her daughter by God. Through Overcomers Through Christ, Michaela and Zach Valentine um, became acquainted with Cecilia and just like the other members of the group they got sucked into Cecilia's world and things quickly spiraled out of control. At some point Rhea realized that the Know Your Enemy cause was way too focused on Satan and Satanism and she wanted to move the direction or the focus back to God and so at this time she developed a new cause that was called Know Your Savior. This course was developed under the supervision of Pastor Reginald Ben Dixon who was guiding Rhea through this transition and another person who was also helping Rhea with this transition, this new course was a woman, an attorney called Natasha Berger. Natasha had helped Rhea with her Know Your Enemy course and she was now helping her with the Know Your Enemy, the Know Your Savior course. Naturally, with this transition, Rhea started spending more and more time with Pastor Reginald Ben Dixon as opposed to Cecilia and her group, and this just pissed Cecilia off. Rhea still tried to help Cecilia every now and again whenever she got the chance. I mean, she was still living at the Cosana Flats, so every chance that she got, she would still try to help Cecilia. But of course, because she was now focusing on the Know Your Savior course, Cecilia was not the the center of attention anymore she was not the case study anymore and i think this deprivation of attention just got to cecilia around this time when ria was also withdrawing from the group candace rigevac just left the group entirely she saw a few cracks in cecilia's stories and lies and so she decided to just leave cutting ties with all members of the group ria included so now cecilia was not only missing one member of the group but two and I think that this got to her but her main focus was on getting back at Rhea and not Candace because Rhea was like the nucleus of this group. So as Rhea started withdrawing from the group, Cecilia also started turning members of the group against Rhea. She told members of the group that Rhea was on the wrong path, her ministry was on the wrong path and that only she was on the right one. So she formed her own group called Electus Pideus, which is Latin for chosen by God. The group was very quick to turn against Rhea. At this point, Cecilia already had her claws deep within their skin. They were all very accepting of this idea to form their own group called Electus Pideus and they all had the words Electus Pideus tattooed on them, on some, like somewhere on their body. Cecilia would also preach to the group and they would also pay their tithes to her. They paid their tithes to Cecilia Stain. 
okay so Miranda was a teacher and a single mother of two so obviously she couldn't contribute that much but Zach Valentine being a financial advisor uh, would sometimes make transfers of large sums of money at some point I think she was giving he was giving Cecilia a hundred K per month or even if it wasn't each and every month there were like multiple months where Zach Valentine transferred a hundred thousand rand to Cecilia Stein's account and Cecilia said to them that this money that she was receiving from their tithes was going to um, an orphanage in America and this supposed orphanage was an orphanage that kept um, orphaned kids or abandoned kids of Satanists. They just believed everything that Cecilia said and it's crazy to me because all these people are educated. They're educated people. How did they not see through Cecilia's stories. So Electus Pideas started doing small things to torment Rhea following their master's instructions such as this one time as Rhea was having one of her evening sessions for the Know Your Savior cause they threw petrol bombs outside. Petrol bombs went off in the in the parking lot and this actually led to a, a church belonging to one of the members of um, know your savior almost burning to the ground and after this incident Rhea started receiving threatening messages which she believed was from the occult and as much as this hurt tormented and scared Rhea Cecilia still wanted to torment and hurt her even more so she started planning her next move one day Natasha Berger wrote a prayer titled the dangerous prayer for the kids at the orphanage and this prayer was prayed at one of Rhea's evening sessions. Somehow Cecilia found out about this prayer and she decided to tell the group that because of this prayer 170 kids had died at the orphanage and she used this as her leeway. She used this as her motive to get the group to turn against uh, Rhea so much that they would actually be willing to murder someone. She wanted to hurt Rhea but not hurt her directly. She wanted to do so by killing somebody close to Rhea and so she decided that Natasha Berger was the perfect sacrifice. So she wanted to hurt Rhea by killing somebody close to her but to the group they had to do it because it's what God wanted. Cecilia had actually manipulated some Bible verses to convince them that by killing Natasha they would be exterminating all evil. With the group now caught up to speed, all that was left to do was to carry out the plan. So Cecilia at this point was not yet sure about Michaela's loyalty. She wasn't sure if Michaela was loyal enough to her and so she wanted Michaela to be the one who murders Natasha so as to prove her loyalty to her. The plan was for Michaela to murder Natasha. On the 25th of July 2012, Marinda, Zeg, Michaela and 13 or 14 year old Marcel all got into the car and headed over to the complex where Natasha lived. When they got there, the teenager, Marcel, got out of the car with pepper spray in her hand and began knocking on Natasha's door. The plan was that once Natasha had let her in, she would use the pepper spray on Natasha to neutralize her and then the rest of the group would come in to murder her. But Natasha was feeling a bit suspicious about this. She was very wary of this person knocking at the door and so she didn't open the door. She didn't let Marcel in and I hate to say it but she had just bought herself an extra day. The group then left. They went back to Cecilia Stain's apartment to just kind of formulate a different plan. So they decided that they needed to find someone that Natasha trusted and that they would use that person as bait to get to Natasha. And because Natasha had at some point been part of the group or she had at some point spent time with the group, they knew of her elderly neighbor called Joy Bunzaya. So they decided to use Joy as the bait. The following day on the 26th of July 2012, Zach and Michaela went back to Natasha's place with the new plan in mind. They made sure to go while Natasha was at work so that they could hopefully get Joy alone. They knocked on Joy's door and introduced themselves as Natasha's friends and told Joy that they were there to surprise her for her upcoming birthday and they had even brought a gift along. So Joy just thought it was very sweet and thoughtful of them and she invited them in. But as soon as they were inside Joy's house they told her that they were not there for 
some birthday celebration that instead they needed her to write a letter or a note to Natasha that would lure her into Joy's place immediately as she got home. After Joy had written the note, Zach took Joy to her bedroom, put her little puppy dog inside the cupboard and then slit Joy's throat. Unfortunately, Joy was just collateral damage to them and although this was the first life claimed by Alexis Padeas, it was far from the last. When Natasha got home, she received the note and immediately headed over to Auntie Joy's home but when she arrived, she was met by Zach and Michaela Valentine who eventually stabbed her to death despite her putting on a pretty good fight. She was attacked and killed so quickly that when her body was found, she was actually still holding on to the piece of paper that she had received from Joy. Michaela got scared at some point during this attack, so she ran outside the back door and headed back to the car while Zach stayed behind and put the knife that they had used to attack the two victims inside a plastic bag and calmly walked outside to go join his wife. As soon as the group found out about Michaela's cold feet, they began just kind of side-eyeing her, just realizing that she was weak, I guess. So police found Know Your Savior and Know Your Enemy cause material on the scene and so they quickly just assumed that the murders were all cult related. While the police were still investigating Natasha's murder, Cecilia then suddenly shifted her attention from Natasha to Pastor Reginald Bendixson. She told the group that Pastor Reginald Bendixson was the reason for, was to blame for Rhea's sudden shift and that they had to take care of him. Because Zach had gained some sort of favor from Cecilia after Natasha's murder, he had sort of become the favorite. Marinda wanted in on that and so she volunteered to take out Pastor Reginald Bendixson. On the 13th of August 2012, Marinda, Zach and 14 year old Marcel got in the car and headed over to Pastor Reginald Bendixson's place. Zach and Marinda were dressed as police officers and when they arrived they told Pastor Reginald that they were the investigators in Natasha and Joy Bunzaya's murder. Soon as Pastor Reginald turned his back towards Zach, Zach took out an axe and hit him with it on the back of the head. Pastor Reginald fell to the ground and Marinda just immediately started stabbing him repeatedly in the stomach. Zach was also not stopping with their ex and they were just going they were just going ham on this poor man. Eventually after this attack, Marinda decided to slit Pastor Reginald's neck to ensure that he was indeed dead. Marcel was there to witness this entire attack. She was present during this entire attack and she witnessed as her mother took out, took the life of Pastor Reginald Bendixson. Police yet again suspected that this was a satanic murder and they quickly connected the two crimes because, I mean, come on, these people were both associated with Overcomers Through Christ and they were both associated with Know Your Enemy and Know Your Savior. Most of the people that were questioned and interviewed by the police all pointed to Cecilia Stain, but because Cecilia Stain was not present at the scene, I think this is how she managed to just get police to overlook her. She was always home. Everybody knew that Cecilia was always home, so yeah, the police didn't really find much evidence to link her to the crime. Very unfortunately, Rhea was also brutally interrogated by the police because they believed that she had some sort of involvement because of Overcomers Through Christ and because of how close these people were to her. And considering that she was already hurting, she was tormented, she was scared, she was in pain, she was mourning the loss of her two friends, so like her two friends who died so close to each other, who were murdered so close to each other, I just think that it was heartless, but the police were just doing their job, they didn't know. But this just goes to show that Cecilia tormented Rhea even in ways that she had no idea of. On the day of Pastor Reginald Ben Dixon's funeral, Rhea received a package at her door and that package was a piece of meat wrapped in a letter that read, Sorry, this is all the doggies left you. Here's a piece of your precious Reggie and this absolutely freaked her out. Although this is just a piece of pork, 
this scared Rhea. It tormented her. It broke her heart so much that she later decided to move away and cut all ties with Cecilia and everyone in the group and she also assumed a new identity with hopes to just forget everything leave everything behind her so as previously mentioned Michaela running out during the murder of Natasha just kind of raised it raised the red flags in the group and they realized that Michaela was their weakest link so they started planning her murder they decided that it would be best to silence her permanently and it's crazy to me that Zach at this point chose to be loyal to Cecilia over his own wife. On the morning of the 4th of October 2012, Zach Valentine left his home in the morning for work just as Marcel and Marinda were leaving the Kosana flats and heading over to Zach Valentine's home. The plan was that Zach had to be at work to make sure that he had a foolproof alibi because it would be so easy to connect Zach to the murder if he was there. So he went to work but he left the garage door open so that the two of them could enter swiftly. What he had also done in preparation for this murder was he had drugged Michaela. He put some sleeping pills in Michaela's coffee and this instantly knocked her out. When Marinda and Marcel got to Zach's house, Marinda went in first but Marcel was close behind. She walked into Michaela's bedroom and she found her still fast asleep on the bed that she shared with her husband who planned her murder. So she walked in and this entire time Marcel is coming behind her and then she decides to hit Michaela with a hammer on the head. This impact woke Michaela up and that's when Marinda said to her, Michaela, pray, I'm going to kill you. And then I told her, Michaela, pray, I'm going to kill you. And then she just continued hitting her on the head with this hammer. At some point she switched to a knife and started stabbing Michaela repeatedly and then invited Marcel to join in on the killing. So Marcel, scared, she couldn't say no to her mother because she had seen what her mother can do. So she takes a knife and then she stabs Michaela one time and then tells her mother that there's something wrong with the knife, it's not sharp enough, so her mother just tells her to stand aside and that she'll take over. So Michaela was stabbed over 60 times in this frenzied attack. So when Zach Valentine came back home, he discovered the body of his wife in their bedroom and then he called the police, um, imagining that he was frantic, probably hysterical, hysteric? I am not sure about Zach's demeanor at the time, but he had a solid alibi, so he was not a suspect. The scene was not only bloody, but it was also a bit odd. Police found certain things that they found was odd. Like, for example, there was an entire wall that had been covered from top to bottom with handwritten Bible verses. So because of that and the other murders that had taken place in connection to Overcomes Through Christ, this was also connected with the other murders and they were all deemed or dubbed the satanic murders. These murders unfortunately soon went cold and they remained unsolved until 2016 when LaRue Stain finally gave a connection that linked the 2012 satanic murders to the appointment murders. So in LaRue's confession, he also explained exactly how the appointment murders happened and he said that they would set an appointment with a financial advisor that they would find on the newspaper and then they would lure this financial advisor from the original appointment location to his mother's appoint apartment and then in the apartment, Marinda would take out a gun and start threatening the victims till they would eventually surrender their bank cards as well as their pins and once the money had been withdrawn from their accounts, LaRue would then strangle them and they would stuff their bodies in the boot of their cars. All this would happen while Cecilia waited for them to report back to her in her apartment just downstairs from Marinda's apartment. Through LaRue's confession, the police were also able to connect the group to another murder that took place four months before the appointment murders, that is the murder of Glenn McGregor. On the 27th of January 2016, Glenn McGregor's family 
found him dead in a bathtub filled with water he had been shot twice and then strangled and then his body was put in a bathtub that was then filled with hot water six thousand rand was transferred from glenn mcgregor's bank account into marinda's bank account and the reference was excellent fuck transfer this was very arrogant of marinda and i just wonder how the police failed to draw that connection between marinda and this murder through further investigations police also managed to connect the group to yet another murder that took place in november of 2015 the mayor's double murder on the evening of the 27th of november 2015 nicholas mayor went home to find both his parents lying dead on the ground in a pool of blood they had both been stabbed in the throat their upper body and their faces marinda stain and zach valentine had both been interviewed by the police because they both had an appointment with the mayors at their house that very day they admitted to having been on the premises but then they said that they were not the only people there that there was another couple and at some point during this appointment the other couple got into a heated argument with the mayors and this argument was so heated that Zach and Marinda just felt very uncomfortable and decided to leave only to find out through the news the following day that the mayors had been found murdered in their own home. The police wanted to do a polygraph test on both Zach and Marinda just to kind of confirm their story but then something bizarre would happen as only two days before the scheduled polygraph Zach Valentine's charred body was found on the side of the road. On the 16th of December 2015, police responded to a report that there was a car burning on the side of the road near a town called Pitcherstein. The car belonged to Zach Valentine. By the time police got there, the body on the driver's seat had already been burnt beyond recognition. Before Zach's mother got to the scene, Marinda Stain, posing as Zach's sister, positively identified the body as that of Zach Valentine and he was officially declared dead. Only two days later, LaRue and Cecilia called up the insurance company and tried to cash out this large uh, cash payout it was I think 3.5 million and this was actually what is known as an early death claim so what an early death claim is is when a person the owner of a policy dies within three months of opening the policy so naturally or as part of protocol the insurance company had to investigate more to find out whether this person knew they would die or commit suicide or whatever the case may be just to figure out whether the death was bona fide in a way essentially that's what they were trying to figure out and then another suspicious thing about this death and the claim was the fact that the premium or the policy had been in arrears for a long time and then just a week before Zach Valentine's death a large cash deposit was made into the account so obviously the insurance company had to look into this to try and figure out whether there's any suspicious behavior there upon further investigation they just kept on getting this hunch that this was one of those insurance fraud cases and so they conducted uh, a dna test on the body that had been found in the car and that dna test came back negative indicating that the body that had been found inside the car was not the body of Zach Valentine. Soon as this came to light, the police were approached and informed of this and so the search for Zach Valentine began. Zach was found living on the street as a homeless person under the name of Michael De Villiers. and it's just so crazy to me that all these people were just willing to let go of their lives just like that for Cecilia Stain because the group had actually just abandoned him. The moment he started living on the streets, nobody cared about him nobody was giving him money nobody even visited him so it, it it is beyond me how these people were just so willing to throw away their lives just like that for cecilia each and every single one of them so once zach valentine had been found on the streets he was arrested and this was only three days after larue and marcel's arrest so six months after faking his own death, the walls were finally closing in on Alexis Pideus. But now with Zach Valentine having been found, this begged the question 
of whose body was in the car. It was later discovered that the body that had initially been presumed to be that of Zach Valentine was the body of Jared Jackson. Jared had been living on the streets with his girlfriend for some time. They had suffered from drug abuse and had found themselves on the street and through living with, on the street is how they met Cecilia and became acquainted with not only Cecilia but her entire group. Unfortunately, unbeknown to them, Cecilia had actually decided that Jared would be the body that they used to legitimize this Zach's fake death. So on the 16th of December, Jared, Zach and LaRue all went for a drive in Zach's luxurious car and on the way there, LaRue drugged Jared and then strangled Jared to death. They all then parked the car on the side of the road, carried Jared's body, placed it in the driver's seat and then set the car ablaze. Just like that, they had murdered yet another person. So Marinda, Cecilia, Zach and LaRue were all directly linked to this insurance fraud case and through this is how the police actually managed to arrest Cecilia Stain and Marinda Stain and finally, finally Electus Padeas were all behind bars. So through LaRue's confession yet again, the police came across a man named John Bernard who was involved in the murder of Glenn McGregor as well as the murder of Jared Jackson. Soon as police approached John and confronted him with the facts and everything that they knew, John immediately asked for a plea deal. He told the police, you know what, I'll confess to everything in exchange for a lighter sentence. LaRue also approached the prosecution with the same deal, a uh, lesser sentence in exchange for full cooperation with the state. Both of them then pleaded guilty to all their charges and John Bernard was sentenced to 20 years in prison while LaRue Stain was sentenced to 25 years imprisonment. Miranda also later came forward with a plea deal, a similar plea deal, and she pleaded guilty to the charges but because she failed to fully cooperate with the state, she was sentenced to 11 life sentences to be served concurrently with an additional 115 years for related charges. So these three were now convicted and sentenced and by the time that the other three's trial began in 2018. They had already started serving their sentences. In this case, for the remaining three people, uh, Zach was accused number one, Cecilia Stain accused number two, and Marcel Stain accused number three. And, and Zach was accused number one because the charges had originally emanated from the initial insurance fraud case. So because Cecilia Stain was not physically there at the locations of the crimes, she did not physically uh, participate in the murders and all that, all the crimes that the, that the crew had participated in, it was going to be hard for the state to nail her. And they knew that with her being the mastermind, they kind of had to nail her her it was important for them to nail her than it was to nail all the other parties because if she was to walk out walk free she would probably find another group and do the same thing to that other group so the state approached this case as a case of a crime syndicate as opposed to a case of just like a regular murder or regular murders they knew that this was the best shot that they had at nailing cecilia that if they approached it in this way, then all they had to prove was that Cecilia was essentially the mastermind, that she was the brain, the brains behind each and every single operation that the, the, the group um, carried out. The state also had about 52 witnesses with LaRue Stain and John Bernard being the most crucial and essential witnesses. Without their statements, I don't think it would have been as possible for them to nail this group because they literally ratted them out they were sharing all essential details that honestly speaking without their confessions this case would have been probably thrown out larue gave a truthful uh testimony and he recalled the event as accurately as he possibly could and so did john bernard marinda stain also took the stand but of course marinda was testifying on behalf of cecilia stain on behalf of the accused the three accused people marinda 
not it's not shocking but Marinda took responsibility for every single thing and she was essentially trying to exonerate Cecilia and Marcel when she took the stand she confessed to doing every single thing which is what LaRue had done at the very beginning she confessed to every single thing gave the details of everything and not only took responsibility for everything but he also she also discredited um larue's confession calling him a liar calling him jealous of his sister calling him all sorts of names and just completely pushing him to the side it is just crazy to me how marinda was always willing to just throw her kids under the bus for this woman. Zach Valentine also took the stand and just as Marinda he also tried to like dodge responsibility Cecilia as well and honestly speaking ugh, I'm not even gonna bore you with the details because Cecilia all she did was say I don't know to everything she not only denied everything but most of the questions she was just like I don't know ask her like when she was asked why these people were paying were giving her these large sums of money she would just say I mean ask them what was I supposed to do was I supposed to say oh no take your money take your money if you're gifting me your money I'm gonna take your money that's basically what she was saying she was trying she was not only denying it not only saying she doesn't know anything but she was also trying to make the stories that these people that she was telling these people she was making it seem like they were ridiculous and they were crazy so that people could think oh, oh yeah like these people like she was making it like for example the story of her being a werewolf there was some story of her being a werewolf i'm not even gonna get into that but she was just like Th that's ridiculous that's crazy a werewolf Psh, come on you know she was trying to make it seem like these people were delusional and they were crazy and that they wanted to believe it and they did whatever it is that they did because they wanted to do it and she never told them those stories cecilia was a lot i think her her testimony was infuriating it was infuriating even more than marinda's because oh i don't even have words to put after that because it was just infuriating okay the last person the last accused to take the stand was marcel stain and what she did was completely unbelievable because when marcel got on the stand after marcel had taken the oath she just confessed to every single thing she was being truthful with every single thing and her testimony actually corroborated with um john bernard's testimony as well as her brother's testimony and it completely demolished it completely discredited it demolished it destroyed marinda's statement it destroyed everybody's statement because she was being truthful and this was in cor corroboration with the other two um the other two state witnesses testimonies it was crazy and actually after taking the stand marcel was so scared for her life shame she asked for her to be moved to a different facility because she said that if she were to go back to the same facility where she was being held with her mother and Cecilia that they would kill her and she was moved to a different facility in the end Zach Valentine was given eight life sentences and an additional 93 years for related charges Cecilia Stain was given 13 life sentences and 155 years imprisonment for additional charges and finally Marcel Stain was given seven life sentences and an additional 144 years and although she finally came to the light and started confessing unfortunately it was too little too late because the state couldn't help her at that point this entire time she had been difficult she had been approached multiple times uh the state was asking her to take a plea deal asking her to get into this plea agreement with them and she had been refusing this entire time so unfortunately for her this was way too late it is great that she did come to the lies that she did um confess because her testimony was also very crucial to this case but at the end of the day this did not help her in any way apart from clearing her conscience i guess because it was too little too late like the state couldn't help her at this point that's just the way that it is this case had a happy ending indeed justice was finally served as the people who had terrorized the town of Krugersdorp for years were finally all put behind bars. Oh, this was a lot. I don't think I've ever filmed a video this long. I've been sitting here for hours.
hours literal hours it's even beginning to get dark outside and i sat here like when i sat here the sun was here and now it's about to set okay it's been hours so thank you so very much for tuning into today's video thank you so much for watching the video where i just rambled on about the cult that has lived rent free in my head since 2021 when i first when i first came to know of them i put my heart and soul into this video i don't want to lie the research was a lot i did a lot even though i didn't add every single thing that i found out it was a lot and i hope that you guys enjoyed it and found it informative and pretty please leave a like down below because that would help me out in ways that I cannot even begin to mention also um, just drop a comment down below of anything really whatever it is that is going on in your noggin whatever it is that is going on in your mind whatever you're thinking whatever your opinion is leave it down below and also subscribe because that will also help me in ways that I cannot even begin to explain to you okay but with that being said that is it for today's video thank you once again for tuning in and i'll see you guys in my next one bye